Years ago, when my wife and I lived in France, which was a time before we had children, so we were a little bit freer to move, sometimes when we'd have a long weekend or we'd have some time off, we would uh, throw a bag of clothes over a shoulder, take whatever disposable income we had, and we would just head off to try to discover what we could of that part of the world. Of course, distances are uh, closer together between interesting sites in Europe, and so we have lots of stories we could tell you about places that we discovered uh, as we lived in Europe. I could tell you, as I said, lots of stories. I'll just tell you one today because I, it has a tie-in with the subject that I would like for us to think about. Uh, one time we backpacked around historic sites of central Greece and the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and then we went island hopping. There are lots of boats that cruise back and forth between the Greek islands, and we went to the Cyclades. While we're on our way to Santorini, which is arguably the most interesting of the Greek islands, uh, it's, some experts believe it was the origin of the legend of the lost continent of Atlantis because it was a large volcano with a flourishing civilization, the Minoan civilization, and then one day the whole center of the island blew up, the volcano blew up, and that civilization uh, disappeared virtually overnight. Anyway, we were trying to make our way to Santorini, and we had to pull in and stop for the night at a different island, and by accident it happened to be an island called Paros, which is also a very picturesque island. If you imagine what a Greek village should look like, this is what Paros looked like. Whitewashed houses, uh, blue roofs, windy streets, donkeys walking around, uh, pe people, women wearing black dresses, uh, archetypical Greek scenes from 30 years ago. And uh, so we just spent the night there and went on our way. But I learned that the main claim to fame of Paros was that in the year 712 BC, a great Greek poet named Archilochus was born there. Archilochus is still remembered some 2,700 years later for a number of things. First of all, he invented the iambic verse. Probably not too many of us know what iambic verse is, although you may have struggled with that if you had to read Shakespeare in high school, iambic pentameter, and so on and so forth. So Archilochus created grammatical or literary forms, but mostly he is famous for an aphorism that he wrote, which is still being discussed, as I said, 2,700 years later. And the aphorism that made Archilochus famous is this. The fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows one big thing. What does that have to do with us? We'll get there in just a moment. But this is an aphorism that is much discussed, as I said. In fact, in a recent book, a management book that was a bestseller, Good to Great, there's a whole chapter that has a title and the concept of the fox and the hedgehog. And I think it's a good illustration of what this aphorism is understood to mean. So I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from this book, Good to Great, because it's a good description of what we're talking about. The fox is a cunning creature, able to devise a myriad of complex strategies for sneak attacks upon the hedgehog. Day in and day out, the fox circles around the hedgehog's den, waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. Fast, sleek, beautiful, fleet of foot, and crafty, the fox looks like a sure winner. The hedgehog, on the other hand, is a dowdier creature, looking like a genetic mix-up between a porcupine and a small armadillo. He waddles along, going about his simple day, searching for lunch and taking care of his home. The fox waits in cunning silence at the juncture in the trail. The hedgehog, minding his own business, wanders right out into the path of the fox. Ah, I've got you now, thinks the fox. He leaps out, bounding across the ground, lightning fast. And the little hedgehog, sensing danger, looks up and thinks, here we go again. Will he ever learn? Rolling up into a perfect little ball, the hedgehog becomes a sphere of sharp spikes pointing out in all directions. The fox, bounding toward his prey, sees the hedgehog defense and calls off the attack. Retreating back into the forest, he begins to calculate a new line of attack. Each day, some version of this battle between the hedgehog and the fox takes place, and despite the greater cunning of the fox, the hedgehog always wins. That's a good illustration of what Archilochus meant when he said, 
The fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows one big thing. But it's not just MBAs who are studying Archilochus' statement. It's not just CEOs. Literary critics have also taken inspiration from what he wrote. Notably, Isaiah Berlin, who was a brilliant 20th century thinker and literary critic, he wrote a still widely read critique of Leon Tolstoy, who wrote, among other things, War and Peace. And the title of his critique was The Hedgehog and the Fox. And he drew a different kind of conclusion from this aphorism. He posits, in fact, that all human beings can be categorized as either one or the other. So let me read a couple of lines from Isaiah Berlin's critique, The Hedgehog and the Fox. There is a line among the fragments of the Greek poet Archilochus which says, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Scholars have differed about the correct interpretation of these dark words, which may mean no more than that the fox, for all his cunning, is defeated by the hedgehog's one defense. But, taken figuratively, the words can be made to yield a sense in which they mark one of the deepest differences which divide writers and thinkers, and it may be human beings in general. For there exists a great chasm between those on one side who relate everything to a single central vision, one system, less or more coherent or articulate, in terms of which they understand, think, and feel. A single universal organizing principle in terms of which alone all that they are and say has significance. And on the other side, those who pursue many ends, often unrelated and even contradictory, connected, if at all, only in some de facto way for some psychological or physiological cause, related by no moral or aesthetic principle. These last lead lives, perform acts, and entertain ideas that are centrifugal rather than centripetal. Their thought is scattered and diffused, moving on many levels, seizing upon the essence of a vast variety of experiences and objects for what they are in themselves, without consciously or unconsciously seeking to fit them into or exclude them from any one unchanging, all-embracing, unitary inner vision. So in other words, according to Isaiah Berlin, some people relate everything in their lives to one central principle. That's what gives them meaning. And everything that they say and do has meaning because they've structured their lives around one principle. And there are others that are going off in many different directions. And uh, there's not seemingly necessarily any rhyme or reason to what they pursue in their lives. And if you want to know what Isaiah Berlin concluded about Leon Tolstoy, he felt that he was a fox who wanted to be a hedgehog. Again, I ask the question, what does this have to do with us? Well, I would like to propose to you, brethren, that today we think about this idea of the fox and the hedgehog because I'm going to submit to you today, and we're going to look in the Bible to see why, that when it comes to spiritual matters in our lives, we must be hedgehogs. We cannot allow ourselves to be foxes. To rephrase what Archilochus said, the world knows many things. It's pulled in many different directions, and it loses itself in many different things. But we'll read a verse in a moment where Jesus said, we're supposed to be guided by one big thing. Let's turn now to 1 John chapter 2, if you would. 1 John chapter 2. Start reading in verse 15. 1 John chapter 2. We'll read verses 15 and 16. John said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So John sums up what motivates people in the world 
with three different things. And essentially, he says these are the main motivations that people pursue in their lives. The lust of the flesh, all that is materialistic, all that is egocentric or exploitive. The lust of the eyes, what looks beautiful, the desire to possess something that is beautiful. And the pride of life, the desire to appear better than others or to be better esteemed than someone else. I think, if we think about it today, that's still what motivates many people in the world, perhaps everyone in the world. We're motivated by those things. It sounds very modern, doesn't it? Yet this is something that John wrote about 2,000 years ago. So, yet today, people in the world will pursue first one thing, and then before they even manage to attain it, they get distracted by something else, and they go off in a different direction. This new game, this thing on my phone, this new video, This new feed on my Facebook page, this cute singer, this great song, this new series on TV, this cool Xbox game. It's all fascinating, and it's all pulling us in different directions. Canadian Stephen Leacock wrote about a man who flung himself upon his horse and rode madly off in all directions. That's what much of the world does today, isn't it? We fling ourselves on our horses and we furiously ride off in all directions, which, of course, gets us precisely nowhere. So you think about YouTube and all the stuff that's on there and pop culture and movies and music and magazines, everything that's on the Internet, all of those things that people pursue today. They're distracted by all of those things. It takes up a huge amount of their time. Yet John wrote these words some 2,000 years ago. The world never really changes. People were foxes back then about their lives, just like people are foxes today about their lives. This is as ancient as mankind. If I can say a word to the young people who are here, sometimes young people, dazzled by all the glitzy details of their generation, and the details change of civilization change, the details change from generation to generation, And sometimes young people are tempted to think that the world today is totally different than anything that's ever happened before. And anybody from a previous generation is absolutely incapable of understanding the world today. You ever had a conversation like that? I remember telling my parents, you can't possibly understand. This is a new world. You grew up in the old world. You can't understand what life is like today, what my life is like today. Sometimes parents will say to their children, oh, I remember what that felt like. And young people are tempted to roll their eyes and think, how could you possibly, back in ancient times when you grew up, things are totally different. This is the real world today, the modern world. It's all different. You can't know that. But when we see how John described the world, people were pursuing the same things. Now, I agree, some details have changed. The names of the singers have changed. The names of the latest gadgets have changed. But the fundamental principles of human life do not change. The fundamental things that motivate people in the world in which we live don't change. So where I'm going with this, young people, is when your parents tell you they understand something about your life, they really do because they've been through it. And the fundamentals of human life really hasn't ever changed. In many ways, to your parents, it seems like it was just yesterday. They can think back on it, and it doesn't seem very long ago that they were exactly where you are. They remember what it's like, the rushing, thrilling emotions of youth, discovering the world. I said, they won't get all the details. The latest fad names are going to change. That's really the unimportant stuff. But the important stuff doesn't change. And so you would do very well to listen to them, not just hear them out. There's a difference between listening and hearing them out. Hearing them out is, okay, I'm going to sit here and listen through the lecture, and then I'm going to get to go and do what I want. Listening to them is a different thing, where you really try to understand what they're telling you. They can save you a lot of trouble and a lot of bad decisions. Okay, I'm closing that parenthesis now, and we're going back to what we were talking about before. People in the world know many things. In fact, Jesus even said the people in the world are shrewder than the children of light, than you and I are. They know more stuff, in some ways, than you and I do. 
Let's look at where Jesus said that in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Verse 1. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. So this fellow was managing the estate, the estate manager, and he was dishonest. He had his hand in the cash register, so to speak. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. What's my solution? I know what I'm going to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So we called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50, giving you a 50% discount. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master, now this is a rather odd reaction. The master doesn't appear to get angry, although I probably felt some uh, righteous indignation. But the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. This was was a, a crafty fellow. He figured out a way to feather his bed one more time before he gets fired. He's building his situation for his next job or after his job as employed as a, as a steward for this man. And then Jesus concluded, the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generations than the sons of light. They're shrewder. They can think of ways to get out of a tight spot by lying, by cheating, by stealing. And in this world, sometimes you do get ahead or at least stay out of trouble temporarily. We know that ultimately you're going to reap what you sow. But the children of this world, they know how to play the angles. And they don't have to be entirely honest about it. They don't mind lying or cheating or stealing to get ahead or to get out from under a punishment. People in the world can be what we call streetwise, which doesn't mean really obeying the law. It means finding a way to play the angles, how to get out of all sorts of sticky situations that they got themselves into. Things like that happen often in the world. People know how to get ahead. But as I said, that only lasts for a while, and ultimately the Bible tells us we will reap what we sow. And all of that stuff that people in the world know, all that shrewdness that's out there, that's not what we're supposed to know. We're not supposed to be that way. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Christians have a different point of view about how to take care of their needs and how they make their way through the world. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we have to choose where our treasure is going to be. What's going to be important to us? The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, if you're looking at wrong things, if your focus is incorrect and ungodly, then you'll be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And there are a lot of folks in the world in which we live that are full of that kind of darkness. They live in a spiritual darkness, and they're not happy. Sometimes they think they are, but really down deep inside, they're not, because that's not the way that leads to happiness. So Jesus says you should have other priorities. Verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If we could do that, a lot of us would be taller than we are today. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. 
So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. That's their focus, materialistic stuff. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. The world pursues all those other things in a spirit of darkness. Jesus said, your priority is to be pursuing the kingdom of God, and if you do that, the rest will sort itself out. The rest will take care of itself. I will see to it that you have what you need, as long as you're pursuing that one big thing. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Christians are to know one big thing. As Isaiah Berlin put it, a single universal organizing principle in terms of which alone All that we are and say has significance. For you and me, that one big thing is pursuing the kingdom of God. That's our one big thing. And if we do that, the rest will take care of itself. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I think this is one of the most fascinating encounters, discussions that we have in the whole New Testament, certainly one of them. Luke chapter 10, verse, starting in verse 38. Lots of lessons that can be drawn from these few verses. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet And heard his words. What was Jesus talking about? He always talked about the kingdom of God in one way or another. All of his parables, almost all of his instruction, all of it had to do somehow, in some way, with the kingdom of God. And that's no doubt what he was talking about here. Mary sitting at his feet, learning about that one big thing. But Martha was distracted, it goes on to say. Martha was distracted with much serving. Now, there's nothing wrong with serving. She wanted to be a good hostess. That's perfectly understandable. She's distracted, though, from that one big thing by much serving. And she approached him and said, the irony here makes me smile. Here's this woman coming up to the Son of God and telling him, giving him an order, make my sister do this. (laughs) And we'll see what kind of answer he gave. She said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? I'm having to do all the sandwiches by myself. Tell her to help me. (laughs) It's pretty audacious. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. That's what happens to foxes. They're worried about many things. They're going off in all directions. But he said, one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part. She's got her priorities correct. I'm sorry, Martha, but you don't right now. You're distracted and troubled by many things. One thing is needed in this situation. And it certainly will not be taken away from her. She's doing it right. One thing, one big thing is needed. And that had to do with the kingdom of God. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 13. Philippians 3 verse 13. Paul said, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I haven't already crossed the finish line. I don't have it in my hands yet. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal 
for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And ultimately, of course, once again, that means the kingdom of God. That's where we're headed. That's our goal. That's the prize that's being held out to us. And so I forget all of these other things, all of the things that can be distracting or troubling, the things that can crowd our lives full and crowd out that one big thing if we allow that to happen. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the centrality of the kingdom of God to the message of the Bible and what God's people have been thinking about is really quite stunning. If you ever just do a study of that, look for references to the kingdom of God all through the Bible and you'll find them from beginning to end. That's the light motif running through the word of God, the kingdom of God. Let's look at a couple of examples. We're just going to run through time very quickly. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 to start with. Here we are in the third chapter of the Bible, maybe the first week or two of human life. This is at the very beginning of the human story. Adam and Eve have just been tempted by Satan in the form of a serpent, and they have succumbed. And God gives a prophecy. Verse 14, Genesis 3, verse 14. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is really talking about the establishment of the kingdom of God. Satan was going to be allowed to act for a certain amount of time. He would orchestrate the death of Jesus Christ, which he did. But that was only a temporary, it wasn't even a setback. It was all part of God's plan. He was able to do some harm, but God had made that part of his plan already. And ultimately what's going to happen is that his head is going to be bruised. He's going to lose completely and be replaced as ruler in this world, by the Son of God. Already in the third chapter of the Bible, the first real prophecy that we have in the Bible here is about the kingdom of God, the confrontation between Satan, the adversary, and God, and how the kingdom of God is ultimately going to triumph, is going to be established on the earth. Right from the very beginning, God sets up this dynamic and makes it clear to the people with whom he's working. Did Adam and Eve understand all of that? I don't know. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But did you notice the reference here that it talks about the serpent eating dust? Uh, Let's compare that with something that's found in Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. We'll start reading in verse 25. Isaiah 65. This is a millennial chapter here. Let's read verse 25. You'll recognize the millennial references here that are found in other passages in Isaiah as well. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. What period of time is that? That's the millennium. That's when the kingdom of God has been established on the earth. And look at the next thing that's mentioned here. Dust shall be the serpent's food. That's a reference going back to Genesis chapter 3. When God said, you're going to go on your belly and you're going to eat dust. That means you're going to lose in this conflict in the end. You're not going to win. You're a loser. And we have it in the context here of the establishment of the kingdom of God. That's when the serpent is going to eat dust. He's going to be completely and ultimately defeated. First prophecy that we have in the Bible is about the kingdom of God. Later on, around 1800 BC or so, 1700 BC, more or less, we come to the time of Abraham. And if let's look at a prophecy or an explanation that was given there in Genesis 22. Genesis 22. So we've moved forward maybe 2,000 years from the Garden of Eden, more or less. Genesis 22. Abraham and Isaac knew about the establishment of the kingdom of God. Genesis 22, verse 18. 
God says to Abraham, in your seed shall all, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. What does that mean? In, all the, all the, in your seed, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed. What is that a reference to? That's a reference. The seed is Jesus Christ. And all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed in that seed because he's going to rule and reign in righteousness over all the nations of the world. This is a reference to the kingdom of God being established and how it's going to rule over all the nations of the world. Turn a couple of more pages, if you would, to Genesis 26. Genesis 26, verse 4. So this is Isaac now who's being given the, tra- the promises being transferred to him. Genesis 26, verse 4. To Isaac, I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It's another prophecy about the kingdom of God. A descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be the Messiah who one day would rule the entire earth and be a blessing to all the nations. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob understood the fundamentals of the kingdom of God. It was part of their understanding of the world. Let's move forward in time once again, about roughly 1,000 B.C., 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2, we're going to read, it's verse 10 especially, that we're interested in. But let's think about, let's set the scene here a moment for what Hannah is about to say. Uh, Hannah seems to have been not a noble woman. She doesn't seem to particularly have been outstandingly educated for the time. She wasn't a spiritually erudite person any more than any other Israelite would have, a woman would have been at the time. She was a very righteous woman. And she was going to give birth to the prophet Samuel. But this is just the prayer of, we might say, an average Israelite woman. And she understood some of the key principles of what was going to happen about the kingdom of God. Verse Samuel chapter 2, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Those are clear references to the Messiah once again. There was no king in Israel at this point. This is before the kings were established. So what king is it talking about? The king of kings, the Messiah, the one who was anointed by God. The adversaries of the Lord will be broken in pieces. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. To me, that's a really fascinating window into what the average Israelite would have understood. This woman, sort of an average Israelite woman, she understood the fundamentals of the kingdom of God. God was going to rule the entire world. He was going to have a king who was going to do that. And it was going to be done in righteousness. And his enemies would be destroyed. No, Israelites understood this. The people with whom God was working, they knew the fundamentals of the gospel of the kingdom of God. A generation or so later, we come to David. Let's go to Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Psalm 96, verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. David understood about the Messiah coming to reign over the earth in the kingdom of God. And interestingly, you can find this psalm. I won't take the time to go there now, but you can make a a note uh, if you want to check it later. You will find this psalm quoted in 1 Chronicles 16 at the time that the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into Jerusalem. And this psalm was quoted or perhaps sung 
before all the people of Israel who were gathered together there to witness this great event, they all heard the gospel of the kingdom being preached. They all knew about what God was going to do, the coming establishment of the kingdom of God. And at the end of the performance of this psalm that's mentioned in 1 Chronicles 16, it says, all the people said amen and praised the Lord. They understood, at least in part. They had the fundamentals of what God was doing to bring about the establishment of the kingdom of God. And of course, when we get into the prophets, it becomes even clearer. Isaiah chapter 2. We're just skimming over some of these things. There are many more references that we could go to. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He'll judge between nations and so on and so forth. You probably know some of these passages in the early part of Isaiah by heart. Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's amazing as we go through these passages, it becomes very clear that the light motif that's running through the whole Bible is the establishment, the future establishment of the kingdom of God under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And yet, most professing Christians today have no idea about that message. They, they completely miss this fundamental thread that runs all the way through the word of God. They think the message is about something else, about the person of Jesus Christ or about receiving salvation. But there's so much more to it than that. Daniel chapter 2. One last passage in the Old Testament, and then we'll look at a couple in the New Testament. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2, verse 44. Daniel is explaining the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And he says, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It's becoming more and more clear as we go through the Bible. This one big thing that God's people have always needed to know about, the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 4. Let's look now briefly at Jesus' teaching. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Here's another story from the life of Jesus or scene that we have described to us here Uh, which I think is really fascinating. But you have to slow down and sort of imagine it, set the scene in your mind, and try to think about what was probably going through people's minds here. Let's read this, starting in verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Men generally took turns in the synagogue. They would read a section of scripture, and then they were expected to give some commentary, something like a sermonette. That's what we do today. We have different men who stand up. Uh, They'll read a verse or two or three, put them together, and then they'll give some commentary to help us understand better what it is that's being discussed. And so Jesus was offered the opportunity to do that in Nazareth, where he'd grown up. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now imagine this scene. So he's reading this, and then what does he do? He closes the book, and he gives it back to the attendant, it says in verse 20, and he sat down. And for a moment, he didn't say anything else. The eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. 
I don't know how you imagine the scene. I'll, I'll tell you the way I imagine it happening. As was often the case when Jesus taught, people were fascinated by what he said, even though many times the coin didn't completely drop. They knew that something spiritually important was happening. There was some energy in the air. They, just, they knew something important was happening, but they couldn't quite put their finger on it, what it was. That happened to the disciples many times. Remember when they said, oh, we, how our hearts burn, but we didn't understand what, what, what it meant. We didn't, that happened often when Jesus taught, and I think that's what was happening here. All their eyes were fixed on him. He had all their attention. They knew that there was some spiritually important element in that passage that had just been read, but they, they didn't know what it was. And so all eyes were on him, and they were hoping, clarify this for us. Then he began to say to them, verse 21, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, it says he began to say that, so that seems to be an indication he went on and gave more explanation of how this passage applied to him. But basically he's saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the spiritually poor, the physically poor as well but the spiritually poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is all about the establishment of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, this is why I have come. I have come to begin fulfilling the prophecies of the establishment of the kingdom of God. And look at the reaction in verse 22. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, isn't this Joseph's son? We watched him grow up as a kid. How is it that he can speak like this? How can he have this impact on us now when he reads the Bible, the word of God? They were very struck by the spiritual truth that was coming out at this point. Is this not Another reference to the kingdom of God? That was why Jesus came, to preach that gospel. And it was very much on Paul's mind. Let's take one more look at how this message was translated into the teaching of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. First Corinthians 15, of course, talking about the resurrection at the return of Christ, the time when the kingdom of God will be established. And Paul says in verse 24, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. The kingdom. It is the kingdom of God. That's what's happening here. He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet so that the kingdom of God may be all in all. There will be just one government at that time. This, brethren, is our one big thing. This needs to be the focus of our lives every day, day in and day out. This is why Jesus said in, first, in Luke chapter 14 that we must pay special attention not to allow ourselves to become distracted by the things of the world. Luke 14, verse 26. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. We need to be so focused on that one big thing that nothing is allowed to distract us. Not any other relationship, not any other aspect of life. Luke 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters... Yes, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That might seem an odd choice of words, and sometimes Jesus chose shocking words. In fact, he frequently did that to really get people to think about what he was saying. We understand from other passages in the Bible we're not supposed to hate anybody. We're supposed to love everyone. But the word in the Greek here really is hate. It's a shocking word to make us stop and think about what he means. You can't be my disciple unless the love you have for me is so far above the love you have for anything else, including your own life, it's as if it were hatred. That's how focused Christians must be. 
Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Bear his cross. Remember that our old man has been crucified. That's a cross, a mental cross we need to carry around with us. Where we recall, I no longer belong to myself. I have given myself over to God and put my life in his hands. That's a cross that we bear. And we also say that we're willing to put up with other whatever physically disagreeable things we may have to put up with in this life in order to be faithful to God, whether that's opposition or persecution or anything else that we might face. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That is focus. We're talking about laser beam focus here on pursuing the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So don't let yourself be distracted, he said. Verse 34, well, verse 33. Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That doesn't mean we have to have a huge garage sale and sell all of our belongings. But it does mean we're always prepared to walk away from anything we have, if that's required, in order to be faithful to God and obedient and submissive to his will. Verse 34, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor... How shall it be seasoned? Maybe you've read about this. It's almost impossible for salt, sodium chloride, to lose its saltiness. It's a very robust mineral. It's almost impossible for that to happen. The only way it could happen really is for the salt to be mixed with something else to where its chemical composition was changed and it was, in fact, no longer salt. It might still look like salt, but it actually would have become uh, something else. So we can't allow that to happen. We can't lose our focus. We can't lose sight and concentration on that one big thing. Take heed. Turn over a couple of pages to Luke 21. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Another warning to stay focused on our one big thing. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch what? Well, there are other indications in the Gospels we're supposed to watch the signs of the times, supposed to watch the train of events that's going on in the world, keep track of where we are in the unfolding of Bible prophecy. But in this context here, it's very clear, isn't it, that what we're really supposed to watch is ourselves, make sure we don't get distracted, we don't lose our focus on that one big thing that we must be pursuing day in and day out. Take heed. Be careful. Don't get distracted. Don't mix yourself in with the world to the point where your spiritual composition changes and you're no longer spiritually salt, but you become something else. Let's ask an important question now at this point. We've established, I believe, that our one big thing is to be pursuing the kingdom of God. Let's talk some practical points now about how we can do that. How can we be hedgehogs about the kingdom of God? Does the Bible give us any hints? It does. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 9 and 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. He recognized the model prayer here in this chapter. In this manner, therefore, pray, Jesus said. Here's your table of contents. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. According to Jesus, this should be a part of every prayer when we have time to kneel down and go through this table of contents and flesh out each chapter heading and talk to God in our daily prayer, a part of that should be thy kingdom come, your kingdom come. So the first way we can be hedgehogs about the kingdom of God is to pray every day for it to come and to talk to God about why it's so needed because of all 
the horrors and the debauchery that we see in the world around us and how the world is becoming a darker and darker place spiritually. And the only solution is the kingdom of God. And when we see sad things happen, like terrorist attacks or other things that are going on or disease epidemics or other things, the result of man living a wrong way of life, that should spur us on to pray and to ask God, please send your kingdom quickly. Let everything be done as it needs to be done so that your kingdom can come. God hears the prayers of his people, and those prayers matter to God. In Revelation, it talks about the prayers of God's people coming up before him like incense. It's an offering. God's been hearing his people pray for the coming of the kingdom of God for at least 2,000 years, and we need to continue that. It's important for us... It's important for us to keep our own focus, but it also is important because God hears those prayers, and they do make a difference. And maybe our prayers might be the difference between the kingdom coming sooner rather than later. So pray for it to come. Make sure that's a part of your daily prayer. According to Jesus, that should be part of it. This is the way to pray, he said, and he included that in it. Thy kingdom come. Psalm 77 has another suggestion for us. Psalm 77. Verse 10. Psalm 77, verse 10. I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your works and talk of your deeds. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. This is talking about God's ultimate deliverance. And what the psalmist said here is, I'm going to meditate on what you're doing, what you have done, what you're doing, and what you promise to do in the future. So I believe this encourages us to meditate on the kingdom of God. And God's given us a lot of interesting ways to meditate on it. The parables, of which there are many, Jesus spoke almost continuously in parables, and all of those parables are about the kingdom of God. Parables are about the kingdom of God in one way or another, because that was what he was sent to preach. So take the parables and think about what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn about the kingdom of God from this parable? What's applicable about this to my own life? The pearl of great price, the sower and the different grounds, the honest and the dishonest servants, the wedding supper, all these things apply to the kingdom of God, and all of them have lessons for us. So a second thing the Bible encourages us to do is meditate on what God is doing. Meditate on his works, his past works, his present works, his future works. Meditate on the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Another key, Matthew 6, verse 33. We read this already, probably a verse you know by heart. I hope it is. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Here's another hint. Seek it. Seek the kingdom. Look for it. Strive to attain it. Seek it first. It doesn't say seek it only. So we're allowed to have other goals in life. We should. We should have other goals. We should have hopes and dreams and plans. We'll have some worries mixed in. We'll have concerns, too. But all of those things should be seen in the light of what we seek first. And we can seek other things second and third and fourth, but we need to seek first the kingdom. I would submit to you, brethren, that when we are troubled or dissatisfied or doubting or angry in life, and I dare say we all have times like that in life, It's because we're not seeking the kingdom first. 
When we get into one of those frames of mind, we're troubled, we're dissatisfied, we're doubting, we're angry, it's because we've allowed other things in life to crowd out our one big thing, and we become distracted, like Martha. When we're seeking first the kingdom of God, that will push aside other things of lesser importance. They have some importance, but less. We can't allow other things to crowd out the kingdom of God, our one big thing. John chapter 8, another hint that the Bible gives us. John chapter 8. This is where Jesus is about to explain that he is the one who was the God of the Old Testament who worked with Israel before Abraham was, I am. One of his discussions, antagonistic discussions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But he says something interesting in verse 56 here that I'd like for us to focus on for a moment. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. How did Abraham see Jesus' day? Well, he met with Melchizedek, apparently. We don't know what kind of conversations they had there, but maybe, certainly, Abraham understood the fundamentals of the kingdom of God. We know that from what we already saw in the prophecies in uh, Genesis. It seems most obvious here that Abraham looked forward to those things he'd been told, what he understood about the kingdom of God that was to come, And he thought about it intently enough that it was as if he were seeing it. He did his best to visualize it and to make it real in his mind. He had a clear image of it in his mind's eye. And Jesus said he saw it and he was glad because he concentrated on that. He thought it through. He really ruminated on what he had been told about the coming kingdom of God. Abraham rejoiced to see that day. It's a little bit, if we would put it in our modern day vernacular today, someone would just stop and say, whoa, this is huge. Do you recognize how important this is? What this means to the world? This is amazing. And he was glad. And if we take the time to do that, brethren, if we take the time to rejoice in it, we'll be glad as well. It really needs to be a reality for us. We don't need to be overwhelmed in the distresses of this life as long as we remain focused on the one big thing. We don't need to be obsessed about what we'll eat or drink, not health problems or family trials, not economic meltdown or government corruption, not even wars and rumors of wars. All of that is passing away, the Bible tells us. But something else is not going to pass away. Philippians chapter 4. Let's turn to Philippians 4, please. Verse 8. Philippians 4, 8. 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true... Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Because these are the things of the kingdom of God. This is the way the kingdom of God is going to be. This is the way people will live their lives. This will be what people will have in their minds under the kingdom of God. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. It gives us peace in the middle of the turbulence of our lives to be focused on that one big thing that's going to be noble and true and lovely and pure and virtuous. That's where we're going. That's what's ahead of us. These are the things of the kingdom of God. That's the way of the king of kings. That's the way of life we are to be learning now so that we can teach others when it becomes our turn to do so. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. 1 
1 John chapter 2. We read a couple of verses here before. I'd like to read one more this time. First John chapter 2, let's reread verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is being pulled in many different directions. The foxes of the world are scrambling for all sorts of contradictory goals, ephemeral goals, unreachable goals. And then John concludes in verse 17, and all those things that people are going after in the world, the world is passing away. And the lust of it, all those things the foxes are chasing, it's all going to go away. It's all going to disappear. In many ways, it will be as if it had never been. But he who does the will of God abides forever in the kingdom of God. That will not change. That will not go away. That will never fade. The fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows one big thing. The world in which we live knows many things, the things of the world. But we as Christians are to know one big thing, the thing that makes sense of our lives now and for eternity. A single universal organizing principle in terms of which alone all that we are and do has significance. The kingdom of God. 